Well, good morning and welcome to this morning's service. It's going to be a second Sunday in Advent and it's going to be led by the Reverend Jill Daniel. Hello, good morning to you all the way from Newton Abbott this morning as I've flown into your front rooms. It's good to be with you, even digitally. It's the second Sunday of Advent today. Christmas is approaching and our celebration of Jesus. But we start, of course, with the second Sunday of Advent as we light the candle. Our second candle signifying the second Sunday of Advent. Hopefully you can see that on your screens as well as I can. Scripture tells us, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light a candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope and our peace. Lord Jesus, you are peace, despite hatred and war, chosen in frailty and weakness. Help us to forgive like you when we are hurt or wounded and bring peace into our hearts and into our world, we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our first hymn now, which is in your hymn books, it's 169. It's Come Thou Long Expected Jesus.
what a great hymn to describe how Jesus was born a baby and yet born a king. God is a God of the extraordinary, of the unexpected, and he is still doing that today in your lives and mine. So thank God for Jesus in all that he does. Let's pray together. God Emmanuel, God with us, you flung the stars into space and created your own adventurous world. But when you came, it discarded you. God Emmanuel, God with us, you came to your own people whom you formed in the womb, but when you came, they rejected you. God Emmanuel, God with us, in the freedom of choice you gave to us, you are still so often excluded, like the innkeeper, the cynics, the herods of this world. Forgive us. God Emmanuel, God with us, this year, help us always to receive you, to embrace you, to follow you and choose the right, to honour your image, found even in the homeless, the needy, the stranger and the refugee, in the outcast and the ignored, because you were once all of these things too, in the world you created. God Emmanuel, God with us, make your home in our hearts, Enter our stubbornness and resistance. Dwell in our distractions and excuses. Calm our rushing and scurrying. And sweep clean our hearts of doubt and fear. Come to us, Emmanuel, miracle maker. For today we give you the glory you deserve and celebrate your coming. And we celebrate that glorious night of miracles on which our faith and our hope depends always. And these prayers and these praises we offer you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we now say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is taken from Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 7. And we're reading from the New International Version of the Bible. <clears throat> Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honour Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you, as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness 
from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish all of this. Amen. We will now sing. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Singing the faith 186. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord Unnumbered blessings give my spirit Voice tender to me The promise of His word In God my Savior shall my heart rejoice reading is from Luke chapter 1 verses 5 to 20 reading from the Good News Bible. The birth of John the Baptist is announced. During the time when Herod was a king of Judea there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife's name was Elizabeth. She also belonged to a priestly family. They both lived good lives in God's sight and obeyed fully all the Lord's laws and commands. They had no children, because Elizabeth could not have any, and she and Zechariah were both very old. One day Zechariah was doing his work as a priest in the temple, taking his turn in the daily service. According to the custom followed by the priests, he was chosen by lot to burn incense in the altar. So he went into the temple of the Lord, while the crowd of people were outside, prayed during the hour when the incense was burnt. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right of the altar, where the incense was burnt. When Zechariah saw him, he was alarmed and felt afraid. But the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. You are to name him John, how glad and happy you will be, and how happy many others will be when he is born. He will be a great man in the Lord's sight. He must not drink any wine or strong drink. From his very birth he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. 
He will go ahead of the Lord, strong and mighty like the prophet Elijah. He will bring fathers and children together again. He will turn disobedient people back to the way of thinking of the righteous. He will get the Lord's people ready for him. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know if this is so? I am an old man and my wife is old also. I am Gabriel, the, the angel answered. I stand in the presence of God who sent me to speak to you and tell you this good news. But you have not believed my message, which will all come true at the right time. Because you have not believed, you will be unable to speak. You will remain silent until the day my promise to you comes true. Thanks be to God. We will now sing Shine, Jesus, Shine, number 59 in Singing the Face. Lights of the world shine upon us, set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me, shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory. Father, I simply ask that through my words, your voice will be heard. Amen. For some strange reason, my cat Georgie has found a new place to sit. Not on the pile of papers on my desk where he sat before, 
not on the top of the printer, unfazed when it starts printing, not in the window, meowing at the birds. No, he's presently sat and often sits behind my 55 inch television and he sits at the corner so that he can look out into the room. But he lies on a piece of sideboard that is probably six inches wide. And I have no idea why he found such a place to sit because it looks a bit hard and comfortable and he's often perched there like a bird without room to spread out. This morning, I heard a big thud in my lounge. Yesterday, I heard the same big thud too. And the day before that, sometimes I hear a big thud or a thwack two or three times a day. And it's been happening for over a month now. And yes, you've guessed it. It's because Georgie keeps falling asleep and falling off his perch by the television. Every time he falls off, his claws are struggling to cling on. And I wince and I look to him and I shake my head and I think, why? Why does he do it? Why does he keep going back to that same narrow strip of wood when he's fallen off so many times before? and he does not always land on his feet. He keeps getting up and lies down in the same daft place, and every day he falls. And I always wince when I watch it happen, two or three times daily. You'd think he'd have worked it out. Thankfully, people don't make that loud noise when they fall asleep in my sermons. As human beings, we have fallen daily too. We keep falling into the same trap ever since Adam and Eve. And God is watching us from a distance thinking, oh no, they've done it again. Why do they keep going back to those same mistakes? We've exasperated God on a number of occasions, but he promised a second plan, a plan to save us from keeping on, keeping on, falling off our perch. And the readings today are all about the explanation of God's plan to send, first of all, John the Baptist and then the saviour of the world. In Luke 1, God speaks to Zechariah about the coming of his son, John the Baptist. He says in Luke 1, 15, he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he does. John the Baptist would be responsible for turning many hearts back to the Lord and preparing hearts for Jesus' coming. Similarly, later on, we hear that God's angel speaks to Mary about the son Jesus that she will conceive. The angel then told Mary that she would conceive a son and name him Jesus. He would be great and called the son of the Most High, and the Lord would give him the throne of his father David, and his kingdom will never end. It goes on to say that therefore the child to be born would be holy and called the son of God. And so Jesus is prophesied. God sent Jesus as part of the plan because sin is a slippery slope and we fall and fall again and again. One action can trigger a chain reaction of negative consequences and humans sadly naturally follow the desires and the sinful nature of the body and mind, which can lead to negative thought patterns and sinful habits. And like my cat, we keep on falling off the perch and but we can pick up the same habits again and again, and we can fall into the same trap. Sometimes people start criticizing or backbiting or excusing small sins. And before long, they're talking us into it. And before long, we're doing the same things and end up on the same perch that we said we'd never get back onto again. Sometimes we have to teach ourselves to come to our senses, <clears throat> but praise God, through the repentance and baptism, demonstrated firstly by John the Baptist and then by the love of God and the baby Jesus, which led to the cross through Jesus Christ, we can lay every sin upon him. However we're feeling about ourselves, however many times we've fallen and fallen again, by his spirit, we can be forgiven and he can loose us from the pattern of sin. Through him, we can be overcomers. And these passages remind us of the glory of God to come and usher in an astounding era of grace to come. Perhaps you've been struggling with an attitude or a weakness that keeps prevailing 
and you tell yourself you're never going to fall into that trap again. You'd never be so foolish as to step in the same mistakes again that you do and I do all over again. We can take comfort from God's words. We're indeed told in Isaiah 40 verses 1 and 2, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. God sent Jesus to save humanity from sin and death. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as the Bible tells us in Romans 3.23. Therefore, God sent Jesus to live a sinless life and die on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. Because of the mess and the sin, and God watching on us thinking, oh no, they've done it again. God sent Jesus to reveal his love, his character, his humanity and his forgiveness, to save us from sin and death. If I go back to my cat for a moment, I could actually probably prevent him from falling into the same mistake. I could restrain him, I could get some straps and pin him down, I could try tie him to the curtain, I could move him forcefully to another place but he may return again. I could deter him and put obstacles in his way, but it wouldn't change my cat's desires and willingness to go and sit and lie down in that place again. You see, as God does with us, the decision has to come from my cat because God gave us freedom of choice too. He allowed us to make our own decisions. Otherwise, he would be a dictator or a totalitarian or an authoritarian. God is love. And he would do none of these things. We have to make our own mistakes. I don't know about you and your Christmas shopping, but my email account is just jammed at the moment. I've ordered many things for Christmas from Amazon, Eden, eBay, Baker Ross, Smith Toys and various shops. And maybe you have too. But I don't just get one email in reply. I receive one to say they've received my order. I get another message to say that it's being dispatched from the warehouse. I get another email from the dispatch to say it's at the warehouse and will soon be delivered. And then make sure you're there to receive it when it comes. And then there's another to say it's on its way and will be delivered that afternoon and unexpectedly very often and I'm not ready. Occasionally I get the odd one to say they've tried delivering but it had to be returned to the warehouse because no one was in to receive it. And then the most annoying one of all, of course, is the one afterwards, which says, how was your delivery? Thumbs up or thumbs down? You might enjoy those, but I don't. So I get a constant thread of emails for one delivery, the preparation for a delivery to come. If I make 10 Christmas orders, the email provider is chock-a-block with about 50 emails, all waiting for this delivery. It builds anticipation. It creates and builds the anticipation and leaves us, leaves us with a kind of certain hope that this anticipated delivery is coming and it's on its way. It's probably intended to give us some kind of reassurance that the order is not lost, it's in hand and it's coming. The Bible in a similar way is containing a series of, message, series of messages which bring us the good news that there is a delivery on the way. The Old Testament points out again and again that there's a delivery coming. Messages from God to prepare us of this great delivery, to get ready, it's on its way, the delivery of a baby, Jesus, the son of God. Are you ready to receive him at the door? Are you waiting or will you miss the delivery? The messages from God are far less annoying than the ones in my email account because they bring a message of hope and a reason to be joyful for something fabulous is coming and this fabulous delivery is coming for the whole world. I wonder if you're ready to receive Christ this Christmas. Is your heart prepared? Are you waiting at the door? The orders I make by email are usually most frequently for other people, but they're also for me too, sometimes. And similarly, the Old Testament contains many prophecies about the coming of Jesus. It's for everyone, for me and for you. 
to save us from sin and the power of repetitive sin and bad behaviour and falling into our old ways. And these messages began right at the beginning of Genesis and follow on right through the Old Testament to Isaiah and the reading we've had today and beyond. Take, for example, Genesis 3.15, talking of the serpent. This verse speaks of a future offspring of Eve who will crush the head of the serpent, which is interpreted as a reference to Jesus. In Isaiah 7.14, there are prophecies that a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son who will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And today in our reading from Isaiah chapter 9, another clear message and promise that foretells that the people in darkness will see a great light and unto us a child will be born and a son given and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And Micah 5 too also predicts that a ruler will come out of Bethlehem who will be the shepherd of God's people. And then there's Psalm 22, there are many more, but Psalm 22 specifically describes a man who is pierced, mocked and surrounded by enemies and is interpreted as a prophecy of Jesus's crucifixion. And so Luke, as well as Isaiah, Isaiah 9, prepares us. Luke prepares us for the delivery of the baby John the Baptist. Isaiah 9 prepares us for the delivery of the baby Jesus. And the babies come when most needed, in a time of darkness. Isaiah 9 verse 1 says, the prophet says that there will be no more gloom for all those in distress, for the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. There was indeed darkness. Israel had fallen to the Assyrians. There was gloom, distress and humiliation, but God foretold a new day. There was darkness then and there is darkness now. How much darkness there is in the earth at the moment. I would say that we're surely ripe for another delivery of salvation or the end times or something. There's so much darkness around and we need and people need God's light more than ever before. God's world needs light in the darkness. Are we spreading that light as individuals, as a church? Are we passionate about bringing light into everyone's darkness at this awful time of wars and carnage? One pastor once wanted to share the light back in the days of telegrams. There were no emails then. The old country preacher wanted to pay for a sign to be put up in the centre of town that would tell people all about the true message of Jesus' birth at Christmas. He lived quite a way out of town and did not have any access to the modern conveniences of phone or email. In fact, he could only send quick messages via telegraph from the local general store. Since telegrams charged by the letter, he made his message succinct and short so that the man who built the sign would know what he wanted, but without wasting money. So he rushed down to the general store and sent his message off. The poor clerk at the sign making company received the telegraph message and as the message printed out she gasped and nearly fainted for the message read unto us a child is born six foot long and three foot wide are we sharing the massive amazing good news of christ are we doing it carefully are we doing it are we serving are we doing what god has called us to do in the great commission in the midst of today's gloom and darkness heard in the BBC news or the Sky News or the daily newspaper news of all the wars and the tragedy that we see around us, are we sharing the light of Christ in the darkness? What can we do different to reach them with the light in the darkness? And how do we go about it? Maybe we need to be even more serious about sharing the light in these dark times. How do we do that as individuals or collaboratively? It can happen in a million different forms. It can start small in a, an embryonic way, which is very scriptural, but small things can change the world. Are we ready to change the world? For the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, great light. a light has dawned, joy for sorrow, light instead of darkness, 
victory instead of defeat. And we are called to share the light before the world goes out. Amen. We're going to see a little video clip now. As we are called to cry hallelujah, even in the middle of darkness. Sadly, there is much darkness in our world today, but, but may we be like the psalmist who says, despite what's going on, yet will I praise him. May we continue to praise God and be steadfast in this time of turbulence and difficulty, and to always be faithful in prayer, which is what we're going to do now. So let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, light of the world, your light is with us, even when we wait in darkness, and we welcome your light into our gloom. In our dark world, we think of those who wait with us, who wait endlessly, courageously, longing for an end to their trials, longing for an end to conflict inside and out, for the wars on their doorstep, for the brokenness and the darkness and lives torn apart by bereavement and loss. May your light the light of Christ, banish the darkness for them. And may we continually pray for their witness and steadfastness, even in trial, and travel with them in prayer through their darkness. Jesus, your light is with us when we're waiting in darkness. We welcome the God who brings new life into gloom, through stables and dark places, through rejection or opposition, through the lack of a bed we can call home, or through finance to support every day. We thank you that you come into our lives, whether we're on the streets or whether we're in comfort. So we welcome you, Lord, into the miscarriages of justice and the governments that intend harm and ask you to bring light in the darkness. So we find and we seek your light that strengthens us as we await your coming. May your light banish the darkness. Jesus, your light is with us when we speak into the darkness, when you call us to pray for the shadows to retreat, when you call us to speak the word of God into the darkness. 
Help us to speak out the gospel of light, which dispels the darkness and brings meaning and hope. As a church, as Christians, give us courage to shine the light, so that light may spread to our neighbours, our friends, our contacts and towns, to confront injustice and make peace with all. Lord, help us to accompany them as you accompany us. Lord, bring your hands of healing, hope and strength into a dark and troubled world and shine in us and dispel every dark of our hearts so that in your light and presence we can know joy, peace and healing within. Jesus, we thank you that your light is with us. Despite declining, despite apathy and turning backs on you, we will continue to stand and will continue to speak for you. Help us to be bold, help us to be courageous and help us to be your servants in this world as well as the next and to spread your light in the darkness. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn now. It's a carol probably, but we're going to sing it together. It's I Came Upon a Midnight Clear. If you're following your hymn books, it's number 205 in sing Singing the Faith. This last song was all about peace the message of christmas peace with god through our lord jesus christ man reconciled 
to God. And looking for that reflection of peace between men on earth. So as we depart and finish, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with kindness and give you peace in all that you do this day and this week. Amen. If you'd like to contact contact us about anything that's been raised in today's service, then our contact details are on the slide. Go in peace. Amen.